We are considering the second coming of Christ. The scriptures tell us in Hebrews 9.28 that to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That is to say the second time he appears upon earth, he is now appearing in the presence of God for us. <coughs> Hebrews 9.24 says. So the second time he appears on earth, he's not going to appear to deal with sin. He's not going to appear to confront his people with their sin. And he, that's quite a glorious thing to consider. I would venture to say that there are very few times if ever that you are acutely conscious of God and Christ that you are not simultaneously aware of your own deficiencies. Amen. And uh, not right. to say sin. And what a thought that when Jesus appears, the ultimate appearing, that you will not be conscious of your sin at all if you've lived by faith. It'll just be, it'll just be gone. What a blessed thought. Tonight I want to deal with the relationship of Christ's coming to his kingdom. Deal brief, I'm going to deal briefly first of all with what and where and when is the kingdom of Christ. There's a strain of theology that is quite popular that teaches that Jesus is, is not yet received his kingdom. I'm, I'm going to deal with that. But this is not the case, that you can't be saved without a king. Mm -hmm. That's the position I'm going to take. I'm going to take the position you can't repent unless there's a king to give you repentance. And then we're going to touch upon the relationship that has to his, to his coming. As we deal with this, you'll see that the, the scriptures seem to go out of their way to tell us that Jesus is king and that he's reigning, that he's Lord, that he's king of kings and Lord of lords, that all things are under his feet, and uh, that principalities and powers have been subjected to him, and the, the, uh, the holy men of God went out of their way to make this point. So it's just rather strange that it, it's not seen by multitudes, but it's because it hasn't been declared. See, when the truth is not seen, it's because it has not been affirmed. Now let's look at the kingdom of Christ. What kind of kingdom is it? Is it a political kingdom? Is that what it is? Is there anyone that really believes Jesus has to become a politician to wrap up God's eternal purpose? After God condemns earthly governments and says that they all will come down, every one of them, do you think for one moment that the Lord Jesus Christ would set one up? The one who had condemned them all? His kingdom is a kingdom of grace. Amen. That's what I want to say. Salvation has always been by grace. It always has been. Way back as far as Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. However, there's very little said about grace actually in the Old Testament scriptures. Most of the references about grace, I believe there are about 27 of them, and most all of them refer to man's grace. And they'll say, if I found grace in your sight, a servant would say to the king or something of this sort. Very few references to God's grace. But the ones that are mentioned, Moses mentioned it extensively when he was on the mountain. He said over and over and over again, he said, if I found grace in your sight. <laughs> very, very conscious of it. Ezra, he talked about a little interval of time when the pressure was off Israel. <laughs> when they weren't in the Babylonian captivity and Nebuchadnezzar wasn't wafting them away. And he said, we have found grace for a little space. Now, if you study out all of these references to grace back under the Old Testament, you'll find almost all, if not all of them, have to do with not being condemned. Almost every one of them. It's quite different in Christ Jesus. Jesus' kingship and kingdom of grace does not have so much to do with you not being condemned as it does with you receiving what God has to give. There's quite a, quite a bit of difference there. Now as king, Jesus' salvation is connected with him being a king. This is the association I want to make first from Zechariah 
9, 9. This text was quoted when Jesus rode in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He spread branches before him and their cloaks before him. As he came in and Zechariah told his prophets, he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. What do you mean? This is not your ordinary king. This is not like Nebuchadnezzar in all of his uh, splendor and kingly garments. It says when your king comes, he's going to bring salvation. And that's, that's what he introduced when he rode into Jerusalem that day. He's going to come meek and lowly. Talking about his kingdom now. We're talking about his kingdom now. His kingdom is the kingdom of grace. When Jesus was enthroned, and he has been enthroned, he's been exalted above every name that's named. There's no body that's not under Jesus. There's no personality in heaven or earth or under the earth that does not instantly obey Jesus when he speaks to them. When there's a confrontation of the Son of God with another personality, there's no war. <clears throat> well, there wasn't even when he was on earth, brother. The demons knew who he was. They shrunk back. They didn't come out and fight him. They shrunk back in his glory. He's, uh, he has been enthroned to dispense grace. That's what he's been enthroned to do. John, the first chapter in verse 14 says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. <laughs> it's a different kind of a kingdom. And verse 16, speaking of our Lord, says, Of His fullness have we received, and grace for grace. See, it's a kingdom of grace. Someone says, Well, that was the Gospel of John. That was... That applied to Jesus be when he was on earth. No, no, it didn't apply to Jesus when he was on earth. It's written like 35, 40 years after Jesus was enthroned. This is a commentary on what Jesus is doing now. He came to inaugurate this great kingdom. And John 1.17 said, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ. See, the truth of the matter is, it took a king, an exalted man, to get grace from heaven to you. There are some obstacles in between heaven and earth. Daniel found out about this. You remember when a, uh, an angel, angels have no trouble with men, you understand. <laughs> if an angel confronts a man or a multitude of men or even 185,000 of Sennacherib's army, angels have no trouble just liquidating the host. Amen. When this angel came down from heaven with a message for Daniel, the scriptures tell us it took him three solid weeks to break through this spiritual power that was between heaven and earth. It took him three weeks, 21 days, to get the message down to earth. Well, it doesn't take 21 days anymore. Now there's a king. <laughs> In an instant, he can get it through because he's a king. Overall, what a glorious thing to contemplate. Acts 14 and 3 says, Long time therefore abode they, speaking of Paul, Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave them testimony unto the word of His grace. Mm -hmm. What I'm establishing here is that Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. We really don't need a man to subdue the enemy. We're talking about in heaven, heaven rules. Daniel found this out, and Nebuchadnezzar did too. The heavens do rule. Whatever you may think about earth and governments and powers and despots, heaven rules. Amen. If they don't like Herod, they just smite him. Hmm. If they don't like the world, they just drowned it. The heavens do rule. They don't like the Babylonian kingdom, and one night they just bring in the Medes and Persians and wipe it out. 
the heavens do rule. When it comes to grace, grace doesn't come to you by spiritual muscle power. It comes to you by the authority of an enthroned man who's Amen. been through the water and Amen. been through the fire. Amen. Who in this terrain, the devil's terrain, he defeated the devil in his own territory in the form of a man whom Satan had brought down. Amen. Grace. There are a number of times in Scripture, I believe it's over 20 times, that you read this phrase, the <laughs> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's think of that phrase. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. A little over 20 times that's mentioned. In almost all of the epistles would start out by saying, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And the last words in the Bible, Revelation 22, 21. The last words in the Bible are, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. <laughs> Not the grace of the carpenter, or the, or the grace of a, a young preacher or teacher, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Jesus now occupies a throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Hebrews, the fourth chapter and verse 16, tells us to, Come boldly. Boldly means confidently. Not, not brashly, like barging up in his presence. It means confidently. That is, you're assured you're going to be received, is the idea. Mm -hmm. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. A throne of grace. A throne of grace. See, you didn't read about that back under the law and the prophets. You didn't read about a throne of grace. Now, now we do. Jesus is dispensing grace from a throne. There's only one throne. Let's be clear about this too. There's only one throne in heaven. There aren't a number of them. Subordinate thrones, like those that we will occupy, will be in Jesus' throne. See, he says, he says you'll, uh, you'll sit with me in my throne like I overcame and sit my father in his throne, but there's really just one throne. Now that throne in heaven is occupied by Christ and is for the purpose of dispensing grace because grace is the only thing that can save a person. Nothing else can save them. They can't be saved by a commandment or a directive or suggestions or rules or regulations or self-help. They've got to be saved by grace and it takes a king on a throne to get grace from heaven to earth. And thank God. Thank God there's one there. Fifteen times in the epistles, this phrase is mentioned. That you would receive grace, mercy, and some say peace, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is this is dispensing. It's from God the Father in the sense that it's His purpose. It's from Jesus and that He's the one that actually dispenses it. He is, you might call, the heavenly steward of grace. If you want grace, you've got to get it from Jesus. You could never get it from Buddha huh? or from Muhammad or Allah. You couldn't. You could only get grace from Jesus. You can't get grace from me. I can't get it from you. You've got to get it from Jesus. He's the exclusive <laughs> custodian of the grace of God. And God has given him power to execute judgment. So with divine discretion, he knows who to give it to and who to withhold this grace from. So someone that's on the devil's side never gets it. And someone who's seeking the Lord never fails to get it. Amen. The grace Amen. of Christ. <coughs> now a little example of this, how this works. Acts 5.31 Peter said that Jesus had been exalted, there's the throne, to give repentance to Israel and the remission of sins. Well, how's that? So you say, well, I'm concerned about so and so, they haven't repented. You know people like this. If you're, if you're serious about shining brightly before people, you know people that need to repent. So how do you get them to repentance? Peter never breathed boot or bob about repentance till somebody asked what they should do. Then he brought it up. 
Later he interpreted what happened. He had been exalted to give repentance. It's like a fast grace is what delivers it, see? <laughs> you seek it about the best you can do is be sorry. It's about the best you can do. But so far as changing your course is concerned, you have to have some help. Amen. And Jesus has been exalted precisely for that purpose, to make sure that you can carry through with your resolves. Yeah. See, there were holy people of old that did regret that they sinned. I have sinned and done this grave to iniquity in your sight. See, they, people did this. But they couldn't recoup like they wanted. Years after David had sinned, he said, My sin is ever before me. Now that Jesus is enthroned, is enthroned he gives repentance and grace. He has been made head over everything. Of course, the scriptures proclaim this with, with great certitude. God has put all things under his feet. Under Christ's feet. This is Ephesians 1, 22. And gave unto me head over all things to the church. Now, Jesus is the head of the church. But that's not what this verse is saying here. Jesus has been given to the church in the capacity of head over everything. There is not anything that's not under him. Amen. Right now. There isn't anything. How could he subdue his enemies if they weren't under him? Mm -hmm. And the church is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. See, when it comes to heaven, and they survey kings and principalities and powers, they only see one. <laughs> That's all they see. He's enthroned. Given to the church in that capacity. Now Daniel saw a picture of Jesus Christ being given the kingdom in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. There are a lot of varied interpretations about the book of Daniel. Some of them are profitable and some reveal how far people are really from Christ. But in this he saw one coming in the clouds of heaven. It's a little caveat here that I'm afraid some have missed. He wasn't coming to earth when Daniel saw him. Coming with clouds. He wasn't coming to earth. He wasn't coming to men. He was coming to God. To the Ancient of Days. Mm -hmm. And it says they brought him before the Lord. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. They brought him before the Ancient of Days who was sitting on the throne. Who's God? The Father. And it says at that point there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Amen. And when did he receive it? He received it when he completed his work on earth successfully putting away sin, successfully destroying the devil, successfully plundering principalities and powers, successfully making peace, successfully reconciling the world to God. And when he returned, he was enthroned. He was exalted. And God handed everything over to him and said, Bring the sons home to glory. <laughs> and that's exactly what he's doing. Now let's look at Scripture a little bit more on this. The point is that Jesus has the kingdom now. Now on the day of Pentecost has fully come for the first time and we think sometimes it was probably the last. They were all together with one accord in one place. And you all remember what happened? Heaven broke through that the Holy Spirit descended on the situation. People were empowered to preach with insight, even in languages they never learned, languages other people understood. And it set the city in an uproar. People heard what was going on. And they, they said they were speaking the wonderful works of God. Acts 2, I believe, about verse 11. And the people rushed into that place, and Peter began to unfold. What was happening there? 
First of all, the people were so ecstatic. They were so unlike the Pharisees and scribes. Let's bring it up today. They were so unlike the Bible college professors and the doctors of the law that the people thought they were drunk. How can a person be so excited talking about theology? That's one thing that many places I have been, the ministers have certainly never been charged with being drunk. In the process of his explanation, he opened up this truth about Christ's exaltation. It begins in Matthew, or in Acts 2.29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried in his sepulchres with us to this day. As you can go right there where he's buried. You go right there where David is buried. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Oh, he did not. This would have been an ideal place for Peter to say he spake of the second coming of Christ. Oh, but he didn't. He said he spake of the resurrection of Christ, about the sitting on the throne. That his soul is not left in hell or Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption, and as he raised him from the dead. This Jesus had God raised up wherever we're all witnesses. We, we've seen him. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. This is the first dispensement from the throne of grace. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he himself saith himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord, there's the king, and Christ, the one chosen to deliver mankind. So here you have a Savior and a King joined together into one. So he tells us that the kingship of Christ is in, in fact has to do with Christ's enthro present enthronement that Daniel saw taking place. Then in Jesus appears in glory to John in the Isle of Patmos. He speaks to him in prophetic type language. The prophets use this language. John doubtless was very familiar with it. He delivers a message to the church at Philadelphia. And he said, uh, These things saith he that's holy, that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. That's the language of a king. <laughs> He says to Philadelphia, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Only a king can say something like this. This reference to the key of David was first opened up by Isaiah the prophet. It was like a denoted of absolute authority. And here would be a king that wasn't just a king in name only, like a puppet king. Well, it wasn't like that. This is going to be a king that could, in fact, carry out what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been kings in the world that were politically were kings, but they couldn't do what they wanted. But Jesus is not that kind of king at all. Here's what Isaiah said, Isaiah 22, 22. The key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder so that he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Mm -hmm. Well, when Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, the key was put on his shoulder. In another place, putting the key on his shoulder was stated this way, the government shall be upon his shoulder. He said it was the same, mm -hmm. same thing. My point is that he's king right now. Now, both Peter and John proclaim Christ's princedom, which is a similar word to, to king. Acts 3, 13 and 4, 13 through 15. Here's, Jesus, here's Peter speaking of Jesus. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up, and denied him in the presence of, in the presence of Pilate. How's that? 
in the presence of Pilate. You denied him when he was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead. That is, he reversed. He reversed your judgment. Wherever we are witnesses, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Here, uh, Zechariah said, King bringing salvation. We were by the throne of grace. Here's prince and savior. So his kingship has to do with our salvation. And why did he exalt him to be a prince and a savior? To give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. Then John, he coincides with this testimony. He refers to Jesus Christ as the first begotten from the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. So there is a... He's over all the kings, in other words. Mm -hmm. Now there's actually only one... There's actually only one enemy that remains to really be destroyed. Mm -hmm. he's, he's called the last enemy. Death. <laughs> the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So far as the chief enemy, Satan, Hebrews 2.14 says he destroyed the devil through death. So he's already, he's already been dealt with. He's just in the death throes now. As far as principalities and powers like those ones that detained that heavenly angel that came down to Daniel, they plundered principalities and powers, Colossians 2.15, triumphing over them. When did he triumph? At his lowest point. He was crucified in weakness, the scripture says. And he plundered principalities and powers in the cross. So at Christ's lowest point, as a man on the cross, dying in that capacity, he destroyed the adversaries, plundered their kingdom. You think he has any trouble now? Do you think that he would have some kind of difficulty if somebody led a mighty army out to fight him? He just <laughs> breathed on him, and that would be the end of the, be the end of the battle. Mm -hmm. In fact, the scripture says he's going to destroy them with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Mm -hmm. Jesus was that powerful with his enemies when he was on earth. When they came to arrest him, probably in the vicinity of six hundred soldiers, he said, "Who do you seek?" He said, "Jesus of Nazareth." He said, "I am he." They all fell backwards. Mm -hmm. What do you suppose he's doing now enthroned in heaven? Do you suppose he has any trouble with the people that trouble you? Do you not know he could deliver you in an instant from any trial you're in? Bring it to an abrupt conclusion. Yeah. He'd give you grace to be a spiritual super saint when it needs to be. Without any difficulty at all. He could give you grace to sing with your feet in the stocks. That's our Lord. He's been exalted to do this. He could enable a man who is uh, in a prison about to die to pin out a few epistles that we're still living on the strength of them to this very day. Mm -hmm. The scriptures tell us that he must reign until he had put all enemies under his feet. It is publicly and openly. The allusions to when Joshua brought the kings of the heathen countries that they overcame, he brought them out and they put their the leaders of the tribes put their feet on their necks. Well, that's, it was public. That's what Jesus is going to do. But he's reigning until the Sabbath. He's reigning until the Sabbath. Now let's look a little more at this. <clears throat> that Jesus has been given all power so that he can give eternal life to the ones God has given him. This is stated in John 17, verse 2. So I hear the purpose of his enthronement and his kingship is to work salvation. That's why he's king. He's not king to settle the issues with the kings of the earth. That's no problem with him at all. Never was. Never was a problem. Jesus did not have to become a man to defeat the Antichrist. Let's just be straight up about this. He did not have to be humiliated by the cross and give his life a ransom for many in order to subdue the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people. He did have to do that, however, to deliver us from the power of darkness and translate us into his kingdom so we can make it safely from here to glory. Amen. 
Here in Revelation, the 12th chapter, and verse 10, we see a picture of, of the serpent being cast out of heaven. And we know what happened, what that is depicting by the response heaven had to that. Now, men have had all kinds of speculation of what that was. Well, we don't have to speculate. The verse, next verse, Revelation 12, 10, after Satan's been expelled now from heaven, here's what it says. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. In case people couldn't make the connection, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That was the opening up of salvation. That's what it was. In other words, Satan can't stop anybody from coming to God through Christ. Amen. He's impotent in this. Whoever wants to come to God can come. Was it that way before? Now, the presence of the kingdom is actually declared in Scripture. Colossians 1.13 says he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So there it is quite plain. Again, Revelation 1.9, John says, I'm a companion of you believers in the kingdom and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ. So John was in the, in the kingdom there. Ephesians 5.5 5, Know this, that no whoremonger or no unclean person or covetous man is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So it's the same kingdom. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ aren't two different kingdoms. They're the same kingdom. As Jesus is administering it. Administrating the kingdom right now. Right, let's go a little further into this. I'm showing you that the kingdom and Jesus Christ are, are connected now. Acts 8.11, concerning Philip's preaching. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. There it is. Brought together. Acts 28.23, concerning Paul. They had, when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus. <laughs> that, to me, that's just thrilling to read, to read those. Here again, Acts 28, 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying here is the kingdom of God is being administered by Jesus Christ. And you cannot talk about the kingdom of God now without talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's the one who is administrating. Now, now, of course, the issue is, well, now, how does the second coming of Christ relate to this kingdom? That's the point. Now, that was just my introduction, but my extra sermon, just a couple of minutes. <laughs> this kingdom that Jesus is presently administrating is going to appear when he appears. It exists now just as surely as he exists now. Yes. Just as surely as he's king now, this kingdom is his kingdom now. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy 4.1 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He made known then. Just as surely as this just as surely as this king exists now, his kingdom exists now. You know, it says of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in his own times, he will show or unveil him who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, dwelling in light that no man can approach into, which no man has seen or can see. That's what he is right now. But see, it's not... It hasn't been pulled back and unveiled to every eye. But there's going to come a day when every eye shall see him. Yes. And he's going to be exactly what he is right now. Mm -hmm. And he is that now because we need him like that now to navigate safely from here to there. And at that time, the kingdom. There will be no question about who belongs to God and who doesn't when mm -hmm. Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. 
when he appears in glory, we'll appear in glory with him. Colossians uh, 3, 4 says. Now, he will not appear to set up his kingdom. He will appear to give it back to God. <laughs> and this is rather stated rather clearly in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. The chapter that deals with the resurrection of the dead. That's the theme of this chapter, is the resurrection of the dead. And he teaches that it's going to occur, the resurrection of the dead, when Jesus comes. Then the dead are going to be raised, and the living will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now of this, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end, which he's already identified, is the resurrection of the dead. That's the key thing right there. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all, he hath put, it's already there, all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, God the Father, is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, that is openly, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's, that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. He's going to give the kingdom back to God. And then he's going to assume identity with the ones that he's brought home to glory. And he's going to reign... But he's not going to reign alone. We're going to reign with him. See, it's a dear. So that's the relationship of the kingdom of Christ to, uh, to his coming. The scriptures tell us that I, he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That is, we talk about our body, different body. We all, we all, everybody won't die. There's going to be a whole generation that won't die. They'll be alive when Jesus comes. But they're, they're going to get new bodies. The whole Everyone will. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the last <laughs> trump, there isn't going to be a battle trump after that. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, Thessalonians adds, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's before the living are changed, is the idea. The point I'm making here is that when Jesus appears, that's when the dead are going to be raised. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, when that occurs, that's going to be project complete. <laughs> then the mission that Jesus has was given, first to take away sin, then bring the sons to glory. Mission completed. Kingdom turned back to God. And then one of the great mysteries of the gospel, Christ himself will be subject to the Father, that he might be all in all. He will do so willingly. That is, he will. It it will take that for him to be connected with us. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? For Jesus, for Jesus to forever be connected with us, he has to be subject to the Father. Mm -hmm. Not by nature, by will. The difference. And we'll reign with him. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. And then will come to pass this saying, He that overcometh will sit down with me in my throne, even as I also overcame him, sit down with my father in his in his throne. <clears throat>